Howdy, howdy. Welcome to Hang the Critic with Josh Ball. I'm Josh Ball, and this is Hang the Critic. Okay, am I the only one who finds these sayings just a little bit formulaic? So, as promised, this is part two of what I have now decided is going to be a three-parter. And if you're watching this, it means that either my little gamble has paid off, or I got bored and decided to do another video anyway. Both. 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 Both is good. Now this part is going to be focusing on omittance and alteration. Basically the decisions that filmmakers make when they're adapting something, when they decide what they're going to keep in the story and what they're going to take out of the story. And here we go. Now I'm not going to sit here in my ivory tower and pretend that I don't get excited or pumped or disappointed by film adaptations. Of course I do all the time. When I heard that a TV series adaptation of American Gods by Neil Gaiman was in the works, I was so excited. And the first series was so awesome. And the second series was all right. It happens. It happens to the best of us and to people like me as well. Anyway, on we go. But first off, costume change. Now it's time for analysis of a scene. And the scene we'll be analyzing today is from and this is only because I recently finished this book. The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. As you may or may not know, The Lord of the Rings was adapted into a three-part trilogy quite some time ago that, you know, did all right. But the scene from the trilogy that I will be focusing on at the moment is from this chapter, the shadow of the past. Gandalf turns up at Frodo's house and he rushes to him and goes, Is it secret? Is it safe? Is it safe? And then they start, they have the whole conversation about the ring and about Sauron and all the stuff that Frodo has to do in order to, to you know, destroy the ring and just place it in a lab. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien, if anything, has a very standard plot structure. And that's basically the first two chapters is just exposition. Wall to wall exposition. Here is all the information that you need right in one handy chapter that's about that thick. And the next chapter is, all right, you've got your information, off you go, have fun in your adventure. Now this creates quite an issue in terms of adapting it into a film. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a bit of a written or unwritten rule. I'm not really in the industry, to be honest, so I can't say whether it's written or not. But it's a rule that dictates that three minutes is a good average for a dialogue scene. Six or seven minutes is rare but still exists. It is exceptionally rare for a dialogue scene that doesn't have any cutaways or flashbacks or whatever to go for 10 minutes or more. And this goes back to the maintaining the attention of the audience thing. If you're just focusing on the same two characters in the same room for a long period of time, no matter how important or interesting the information that they're giving in that scene is to the rest of the story, the audience, as it is a visual medium, blasphemer, is going to go slightly bored. So you gotta mix it up. And that is exactly what the screenwriters of The Lord of the Rings managed to do. They took bits of that conversation and they sprinkled it out throughout the story. For example, they touch upon the history of Gollum in that first scene. They go, oh, Gollum, he's in Mordor, he's being tortured, he says, Shala Baggins! Whereas in the book, they give practically the entire history of Gollum from beginning to end in that one scene alone. And what they cleverly did in the film is they took that chunk of information and they sprinkled it about. You get some of it later on in that movie, you get some of it at the beginning of the third movie to maintain that interest. Mind you, three minutes is only the average for dialogue scenes that are just exposition. 
If they are character-driven scenes, that's a whole other matter. When it's about the characters having a revelation in of themselves, or when the filmmaker wants you to get intimate with the character, that's when they take their time. But when it's just information that you need, boom, boom, bam, bam, thank you, man, off you go. I have an excellent idea. Let's change the subject. <laughs> A pop quiz experiment in continuity. What is different about me from the previous shot? That's right, I parted my hair on the other side. Oh, oh you're, you're, you're clever. You, you, you spot this, you're, you're a clever one. Interesting, good, well done. Oh dear. Now the key thing to remember is at, as readers and viewers, we tend to claim ownership in a strange way of the things we read and view. We like to think that this film is our film. This book is our book. It speaks to us in a very special way and it doesn't speak to anybody else. Yeah, it may speak to other people, but it doesn't speak to them in the same way as it speaks to us. But that's not true. As difficult as it may seem sometimes, that's not true. Some books touch a lot of people and sometimes they touch people in very similar ways. Sometimes they touch people in very different ways. Two people can read the same thing and take different messages from it. My ways are not your ways. The same work of fiction can impact different people in different ways. And that's something that a lot of people forget but need to keep in mind when it comes to film adaptation. Because what you're seeing when you sit down and watch a film is it should be obvious, but it's not the book. It is the book when filtered through the mind of a screenwriter, of a director, of, you know, a cinematographer, etc, etc, etc. That filter is what the filmmaker decides is sig the significance of the story. And it's the significance of the story to the filmmaker. And the unfortunate thing is, sometimes it may not be the same significance to you. When there's a specific part of a book that a filmmaker decides doesn't have that significance for them, they may choose to remove it, and you'll sit there going, Oh, that was my favorite moment from the book. Why did they do that? Oh, they ruined it. You maniac! You blew it up! Whilst another person would sit there and watch the same thing and go, yeah, I understand why they removed that. Fair enough. And then maybe even another person that goes, yeah, I always hate that part of the book. Good riddance, f off. The point is, it's different people, different interpretations of the same source material. I'm mysterious, folks. Live with it. Anywho, that's all we got for part two in our three-parter. So look out for the third one because it's probably coming. If this one got here, then the third one's probably coming. All great trilogies come in threes, as they say. In the meantime, like, subscribe, comment, etc., etc. Keep watching movies, and I'll see you when I see you. This whole broadcast has been brought to you by Sam. It's everywhere. Get used to it.